You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. the show on today's episode i'm going to introduce you to a guest that needs no introduction at least he needs no introduction if you have listened and followed our podcast over the last year or two alan donegan is joining us on the show and today we are going to talk about a suit of armor i was conflicted about the episode because i could have very easily titled it and maybe still will alan donegan goes to hollywood but honestly what we're talking about today is leveraging the power of financial independence and the pursuit of financial independence to allow you to pursue your dreams with the ability to be free to fail. I think that's the guiding light here. And help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. And and yeah, Alan certainly needs no introduction around here, but his pop-up business school is a remarkable thing. He's taught, I know the members of our community and certainly many communities across the country and across the world, how to start businesses for very little downside, very little startup costs. And it's just such an interesting rethink on what we all think of as the model, right? You need a business plan, you need lots of upfront costs and all this thing, and you need everything locked down, loans, et cetera. Alan has changed all of that for all of us. And it's really a remarkable thing. And now living this out in his own life, he's taking a chance. And like you said, he's writing a script. And what a cool way to go through life, just experimenting and trying things. And with that, Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brad. Thanks, Jonathan. I am excited to be back. Well, let's talk about this, man. First of all, have you ever failed at anything? Have you ever, have you ever tried a job that didn't work out? <laughs> have I ever failed? I have had more <laughs> jobs than you could imagine. The list I, of... I don't want to just imagine them. I want you to give me the list. <laughs> uh, I worked in a bar. I was a photocopier salesman. I was in recruitment. I did telesales for laptops. I ran kids after school clubs. I was a landscape gardener. I was a grounds maintenance person, plus probably about 10 other jobs. I have tried more things than you could imagine and failed at most of them. Like with that in the background, can we talk about like, what is the traditional path? What is kind of the guidelines that society tells you this is the rule book? If you could give us kind of a highlight reel for that before we reject it out of hand, what does it look like? Well, I guess... An- like I'm not totally rejecting the traditional path. What I'm saying is, are you consciously choosing it? Because that I think is the difficult thing is there is this playbook that's set out for us that you go to school, get good grades. You go to college, you get good grades. You go to university, you get good grades. You get a good job. You get a pet to prove you can look after kids. You get a house. You get a bigger house. You get kids. You work for 50 years. You retire. You die. Uh, And that's kind of the plan that life sets out for people. And what I want to say is it's fine if you want to follow that plan, but are you doing it consciously? Isn't that the story of FI in a nutshell, not just with running businesses, but like you said, that entire 50 to 70 year trajectory that so many of us are on and we don't even think about it, right? It's almost like this societal script. But to me, it seems like certainly people in our community the people that you're meeting. And I'd love to hear if you've experienced other communities that are maybe realizing we don't need to follow that worn script. Well, I think it's actually a challenge to stand up to it. So how society puts that script on us is through the people we care about, through parents, through schools, through teachers, through TV, through radio shows. I mean, talk about the FI community doing it differently. Every radio show where there's a competition the first question the host asks when you've won the money is what are you going to spend it on? I've never heard anybody say VTSAX. Yeah. My (laughs) wife wants to win a competition just to be able to say that. What are you going to spend the money on? (laughs) Uh, Vanguard index funds. (laughs) And that's how society trains us to do. 
And just little things such as probably about two years ago now, we live in a tiny 770 square foot flat in England, uh, an apartment. And the question from our family was, when are you going to buy a proper home? Which kind of leads on to, well, what's improper about our home? And why do we need to upgrade? And if we did upgrade and brought a proper home, well, that puts our financial independence timeline back years. Uh, and we spend the next few years trying to pay off something that we may or may not actually need or use. But it's that through the parents, through the family, through the school teachers, through the radio shows that say you're going to spend money, that's how we get trained to go down one path. And I actually think it takes quite a lot of energy to stand up to that stuff, especially when there's not that many people around you who are doing the same thing, which kind of brings us on to doing things differently uh, to get different results. And Alan, isn't that so interesting about societal scripts? It's funny. My daughter is actually getting set to start middle school. And at our parent orientation, they actually handed out this set of documents. And one of them was touting that they did this stock market game. Okay. And it's exactly the polar opposite of what I stand for and what the FI community stands for, which is long-term thinking, right? It's how can you make as much money in the stock market in a three month game? I saw that and I'm like, wow, this is something they're so proud of that they're putting this on the literature they're handing out to parents. Yet I know that that is not what should be taught in school because it should be all about long-term thinking, not about just short-term, how can I win at the game of the stock market? Do I have the guts to stand up and say something to the, to the middle school principal? I don't even know. And I mean, I talk about this stuff bi-weekly every single week of my life, you know? When's the meeting, Brad? Let's go and see him. I'm coming with you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, fly to Richmond. It's, but I mean, I... I'm going to take this as a challenge. I am going to certainly get in touch. But but my initial thought is, wow, do I have the guts to do that? Do I have the guts to say, okay, this is what society is talking about, but I want to do something different? So I think where it becomes difficult is when you have people who are in positions of power and respect and then standing up to what they're saying. To give you the example in my life, I played soccer when I was a lot younger I turned around to sprint in one particular match and there was a like popping noise behind me and I had a sharp pain up the back of my leg. I turned around, there was no one there. I thought to myself, he must have been fast and hobbled off the pitch. And I did what anyone would do. I drove myself home. I iced it because that'll obviously fix it. And then I went to the doctor the next day. Now, the doctor has a position of authority and of power, and you have to listen to them. I sat opposite the doctor in the room, described what had happened, told her about the pop, uh, and she just lifted herself up on the chair, peered over and looked at my ankle and said, you've sprained it, take paracetamol every four hours and come back in two weeks if it's not healed. And I knew in that moment that it was worse than that. But she's the doctor. Do you think I spoke up? Do you think I challenged? Is that a no. rhetorical question? <laughs> <laughs> if it was now, I would have done. Um, but I think that's the benefit of confidence and age and like this suit of armor that we'll talk about later. Back in the day, I listened to what my doctor said and I went home. But I knew inside it was wrong. So I went to the source of all information. Google. <laughs> Dr. Google. And, yeah, Dr. Google. And I typed in my symptoms, up came this thing. Every There's doctor in our audience is, is cringing at the second half of this story right now. The predictive <laughs> answer on Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, they told me there was a test. So the test is, if you put your leg up on the table and squeeze your calf muscle, if your foot moves, they're connected. If your foot doesn't move, they aren't connected. So I was there bashing my calf muscle going, please move, please move. And nothing was happening. And Google told me I'd ruptured my Achilles tendon. Uh, so I did what any red blooded man would do. And I got in the car and drove myself to the hospital, told the hospital, they scanned it. They confirmed what was wrong. 
they operated that day and tied it back together. And then as I was recovering from the surgery, t- talking to the consultant who did the operation, I told him about the doctor. And his feedback was, if you'd have listened to what the doctor said and waited two weeks, the wound would have calcified and it might not have healed straight again. And I think where this becomes tough is you've got people in position of power who are doing what they think is right, but it's not always. And it's tough to stand up to them. And judges get it wrong. Doctors get it wrong. School teachers get it wrong. There is these things, but society teaches us to look up to these people who don't always know best. They really don't. Alan, you you talked about your intuition, right? And I think that's an important thing. A lot of us have that level of intuition, but like you, sometimes we don't stand up right at the moment. And and you know that we're all about these actionable tips. And I'd love for you to pass along to the audience. What have you learned? What would you have done differently now if that was if that injury was today? And and how can people take lessons from that to apply not just in front of the doctor, but in in all situations in life? The first thing I've learned is a specific language pattern that my business partner Simon taught me, which is to say, I'm not sure if I'm right, but, and then to start the next sentence. So if someone says something you don't agree with, like, oh, you should stop pick. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's right, but, and then you can put your point in afterwards. And it kind of does it in a less aggressive way. And you're able to counter and continue the conversation. The second bit would be to check the facts in the moment. So to say to the other person, I'm not sure that's true. Shall we look it up now? And I would get out my smartphone. I would get out my something and look it up. We had a a specific incident when I was fighting to keep my family home from bankruptcy with my dad. Uh, I was in court arguing a certain point, And the judge very clearly said the statute of limitations does not affect mortgages. I knew this wasn't the case. But again, he was a judge and I didn't stand up to him in that moment. If it was today, I would argue my point and say, well, let's look up the law now. And I would Google it in front of him and I would not let him leave the room until I proved the point. And I think it's really important to have that, A, a comfortable way of challenging something you disagree with. B, the nerve to be able to make them wait whilst you look it up. And you might be proved wrong, and that's okay. And then C, to go, like, I hope you don't mind, but I would rather do it now in the moment than go away, stew about it for weeks, and then come back to you weeks later. Uh, And I think the combination of those three allow you to challenge things more easily. Challenging what society says. I mean, I think that's the overarching theme that we're seeing with this, you know, with this particular conversation. And, And to pursue financial independence you're going to have to make a choice or a series of choices that just as when you look at statistics, the vast majority of the world isn't making. And that's going to take some gumption, right? At bare minimum. And I'm curious, Alan, like what have you, you, you at some point in time became, were willing to make an alternate choice. What was that light bulb moment for you and what have been the results? So I think the light bulb moment for me was actually being fired from my last proper job. Uh, And then looking around going, there's no other jobs that I particularly want to do. And I had to figure out what I wanted to do myself. And I stopped listening to what the world expected me to do, which was get a job. And I said, I'm going to go it on my own and do things my own way. Uh, And you get all sorts of conflicting advice about how to do it. And I think the thing I learned early on is there's no right way to do anything. There's people who build successful businesses by cold calling. There's people who build successful businesses by networking. There's people who build them by debt, by not debt. You can do it in a million different ways. And that really got me thinking about what's the way I want to do it. How do I want to live my life? And I would challenge everyone to start thinking about how do you actually want to live your life? What do you want your life to be like? Because that's the really interesting question that you can then start to work on and answer and start to do things differently. Just to add one more piece to that, 
if you want the same results as everyone else, do the same as everyone else. If you want different results, do something different. If you want exceptional results, do something exceptional. And that's where I started to really stand out from other people. And I think all these experiences of doctors and judges and all these people telling me things that I didn't believe was correct and standing up to them got me to eventually decide I'm going to do something exceptional. So we increased our savings rate to 93%. We built businesses. We helped people. We did stuff that people told us we couldn't do. And we got exceptional results. Alan, what do you want your life to be like? That's a powerful question. How did you and Katie sit down and decide what you wanted your lives to look like? Was this, was this that overt of a process or did it just come to you over the course of weeks and months and years? I mean, talk us through that. In the early days, that's a very tough question to answer. And I quite like Tim Ferriss's spin on this, which is to do mini projects and do something that excites you for six months. So we started to do experiments to see what we liked. And I guess, how do you know what you're going to enjoy? I have spent so much time at the pop-up business school answering the question, is my business going to be successful? Am I going to have fun? How much do I know how to charge for this product? And people ask me all these questions. And the general answer is, you don't know until you have a go. Do you know if you're going to like running a restaurant? Well, you probably won't until you try it. So I spend all this time telling people to have a go at different things. Um, do you guys like ice cream? I happen to love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm an outlier. <laughs> so, how do you know which is your favorite flavor? I usually try everything. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I did. I went and I tried all the ice creams, not all at once, but I tried all of them until I worked out which flavor of Ben and Jerry's was my favorite. And I think it's the same with different jobs, careers, projects, ideas. You just don't know which one you're going to like until you have a go. So Katie and I have been very much down the lines of let's have an experiment. So we experiment running events. We experiment playing the guitar. We, I'm right in the middle of an experiment now. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm writing a movie script. I've never written a movie script in my life. I have no idea what I'm doing. I didn't even know if I would like it when I arrived here, but I'd always dreamed of being involved in the movies, so I wanted to test it. And how do you know if you don't have a go? So, Alan, these really are just experiments. There doesn't need to be some grand end goal to them. This is not going to be unsuccessful if you don't sell this to a major movie house. This can be successful just as a project for your life. Am I hearing you right? I guess this brings us back to what stage are you in? So if I was very early on in the early days when I needed money to live, it would be very different because I'd be thinking, well, the percentage of scripts that actually get made is tiny. I'm not sure I could do this. I definitely don't know if I could actually earn money doing it. So I'm not sure I would have picked it as a career early on when I needed to earn money. But the thing about the getting to financial independence, Christian Bryce came up, a millennial revolution came up with the idea that financial independence is a suit of armor. And I loved their slide when I saw them speak. They had uh, a slide of Iron Man and he had his suit of armor on and they envisaged financial independence as a suit of armor that you could go out there and write your book, write your script, launch your blog. And it didn't matter what the world thought because you weren't trying to earn money from it. And I think it really does make things different. So having got to FI, if my movie script doesn't sell, I don't really care. I would like it to go into the world and I would like my stories to inspire people and educate people and share things. But if it doesn't work, I have nothing on the line except my time. And I think that changes the way you do things when you work because you want to, not because you have to. And I always come back to, and this is a movie analogy because that's what I'm studying at the moment, but Arnold Schwarzenegger was a millionaire before he did his first movie. 
And that money allowed him to reject roles that he didn't want and to choose ones that actually fitted what he wanted to do. And I think he had one of the early versions of the financial independent suit of armor where he was able to take Hollywood on his own terms rather than the other way around. I think that's what financial independence really provides you. So if you can build the base, then you can go on and try things and really do what other people think is risky. But to me, it's very low risk. Alan, one of the things that you said that stood out to me is the fact that for you, writing a movie script is making a dream come true, regardless of profitability on the other end of this, that's not success. Rather, it's you having a chance to create this. And we're going to come back and talk about what you're actually doing with that. But but what stands out to me is so many people talk about their dreams, but they just sit on it, right? They, they never do anything about it. And, I, and I'm curious in your mind, how can we pair this suit of armor for different people in different stages? And when someone, you know, you get that blanket advice, follow your passion, how do we make that a little bit more actionable? So the blanket advice, follow your passion, I have mixed feelings about. And actually, it's under attack. Like Carl Newport recently, uh, the guy, he was speaking about follow your passion is actually bad advice. I'm not sure about that, because if you look at the other advice, which is do something you don't enjoy, you end up stuck in a job you hate. So following your passion needs to be balanced with some kind of you do have to have money to live. You do need to earn cash. You do need to earn money. So if we extended our analogy of the suit of armor, when you're young, you don't really have any armor. You're just going out into the world. Then you build up a bit of wealth, and you could probably tie this into the stages of financial independence as well. You build up a little bit of wealth. You've got a bit of savings. You know, If you don't earn money for six months, well, never mind. Then you've got partial armor. And you can start trying different things. So you can negotiate with your job for some time off. You could go down to three days a week and spend two days a week on your dream. You can try different things. All the way up to full FI is a full suit of armor where it doesn't matter if it's successful or not. So I think it depends where you are on your journey, how bold you can be. And if we take the Jim Collins principle of FU money, if you've saved up that, Well, you can definitely be bolder, and that gives you a layer of protection that enables you to try different things. I am a big fan of doing something you love, and I have seen so many people that make money doing something they enjoy. And it seems everywhere I go at the moment, people tell me they love their jobs. That's what people should be aiming for, is if you enjoy what you're doing with 80% of your time, you're going to lead a fabulously happy life. And I don't care whether it's building a business or doing a job you like, but find something you enjoy and make money doing that. Alan, these people that you're funding who all genuinely love their jobs, have you found most of them or many of them are entrepreneurs or are they in, you know, quote unquote, regular jobs, W2 jobs? Or I know it's a a kind of a random question here, but I'm just endlessly curious because what I always hear is, oh, grumble, grumble. I don't like my job, this and that. But like, you are on the ground talking to people who are doing all sorts of interesting things. And I'd I'd just love to hear just off the top of your head. So I went to the Choose FI meetup in North LA recently and met a load of people there. They were awesome. You do get the people who go, well, I don't like my job. If I could leave, I would. But then I also met a software engineer who's just moved jobs to a new one Uh, because this job has bigger architecture, bigger projects for him to learn things he wants to do. And he's loving his job and he loves what he does. His partner was a dance teacher and she actually is fighting against financial independence. She doesn't get it because she says, well, I love what I want to love what I do. I want to do it till the end of my days. Why would I need to bother with financial independence? And it's a really interesting alternate viewpoint that says There are jobs out there that people genuinely enjoy. There are teams of people that are working to do cool things that you can enjoy. There is work. If you don't like your job, change it. I get sometimes we get stuck with in a career path where if you did change, you'd have to dial back your income to be able to get on a new path. But there are jobs you can do that you can earn really good money and you enjoy. Finding one of those. They're there. They exist. 
let's spend a few minutes talking about getting unstuck. And I know one of the things you just mentioned and kind of in passing was that in some cases you may have a situation with golden handcuffs where in order to go to a different lane, you're going to have to take a pay cut. Any other just actionable advice you think for someone that they're just grinding it out, but they are stuck. And this is not the path for them over the next 10, 15, 20 years. They, how does someone just take a couple steps back and find a new lane? Two examples. One, we've got a couple of friends who they have very high paying jobs, professional service jobs. They earn good money. All of their income goes to paying to their house. They've got a house in a lovely location. They've redone the kitchen. They've redone the outside. They have spent a fortune on this place. And their argument is they need to spend the money to feel comfortable getting through their jobs. And I see the other side where they're only trapped in their jobs because they're spending this money. So I think it's decoupling your spending to get through things and your expenses to be able to take a job you want. The second element is challenging. Just because it's a job you enjoy doesn't mean it won't pay well. There are jobs out there that pay very well and are great fun, and it depends what you enjoy. So I would challenge that thing that if it's a a worthy job, you'll get paid less. And whilst that's certainly true in certain charitable things and different things, there are ways to make money doing something you love, and some of them are very highly paid. Alan, this question is going to be oddly specific, but I've noticed in our community that We are a community of people that actually take action. For instance, in episode 117, Bradley Rice introduced us to this employer or this type of work, this company called Salesforce. And it's something that has allowed him to work as a consultant remotely. He loves it. He says, I will probably never need to retire because I want to do this forever. And he makes a really good income from this. It was so powerful that in our community and actually started a Facebook group just for people that wanted to start working towards getting their credentialing. And now there's a group of people that are assisting each other with pursuing this new line of work. Because that was so inspiring to me, I was wondering, you know, you just mentioned all these other jobs that you have heard of. Do you have a couple of specific examples that maybe you could just give us and so our audience could explore it a little bit further? There's an unbelievable range of jobs. The first one that came to mind was I recently saw a job. I was so tempted to apply for it. There was a professor of Lego. <laughs> Okay. Tell me more. What does that even mean? (laughs) They were studying the power of Lego bricks on education, on helping kids develop, on cognitive abilities. Uh, It's a really well-paying job. And I get to play with Lego all day and work out how it helps people. I was just blown away. That job would not have existed 20 years ago. And I think there's jobs now that just didn't exist back in the day that people aren't aware of. I have this thing of called zone of awareness. My zone of awareness over the years has started to expand because of what I do. I travel around meeting people making money. I help them build businesses. So I'm 40 years old now. So if you go back to 20 year old Alan, my zone of awareness was pretty small. I knew what was in Hampshire in England. Financial independence, not in my zone of awareness. Running a business was because my dad had done it. High paying jobs in London. I'd never heard of an actuary, which was the career my wife eventually got. Bloggers, podcasters. None of this was in my zone of awareness. I just didn't know this stuff existed. And I think quite often what happens is people get head down in what they're in and they're not even aware of what is possible out there. Like Lego Professor. That, all of a sudden, Facebook and an advert, a friend tagged me in the job advert on Facebook. All of a sudden, Lego Professor is in my zone of awareness. It's maybe not yet in my zone of possibility, (laughs) but I'm at least aware it's there. And I think I would challenge all of your listeners to start to get their head up and look at what's possible and becoming aware of what is out there. Because there are incredible jobs, incredible things. You could be a food critic. You could be a caretaker of a private island, a Ferrari driving instructor. You could be a YouTuber, a blogger. You could do social media. You could come and join Pop-Up Business School and help us change how entrepreneurship is taught around the world. Like There are incredible jobs and roles and things you can do to earn money out there. 
you've just got to be aware of them. And I think getting your head up, searching, looking in the papers, telling friends you're looking, Googling for things, all of a sudden this world of possibility opens up that just wasn't there before. So let's talk about this a little bit more. So someone listening to maybe this episode, this is the first episode of the Choose to Buy podcast they've ever heard, but they are convinced they're going to take action. They hear about this Lego job. They go and search for it. They apply and they do not get a call back. They, they don't even get a response. How does someone take that and use it to channel their energy into that next step? Well, I think the thing to remember, it's not linear. None of this stuff is linear. And what I mean by this is you don't do one thing and then get equally rewarded for success. The growth of your fund is not linear. You put in energy and effort over time and then you see results, maybe even years later. The classic examples of this, I started a diet. I changed my diet. I completely changed what I was eating. I cut out sugar. I did exercise. And then two weeks later, I'm looking at my wife going, I've changed everything. Why am I not thin yet? Why am I not healthy? Why isn't this working? It's like, well, it's two weeks. It's not linear. You don't do all this work and then get the results instantly. You have to do the work over a period of time. And then all of a sudden you wake up a year later and you're, you've got a six pack and you're looking handsome. And it's the same with the investing. For the people listening to the podcast, I really didn't understand this. And it's only now starting to hit me. I remember probably 15 years ago listening to a Brian Tracy CD set about success. And he said, when the money comes, you'll be surprised at how fast it actually comes. And I remember kind of laughing and thinking, yeah, whatever, I don't get it. And that's because it's not linear. I've been working at building my business for 20 years. I've been learning, studying, growing. And then all of a sudden, you get that hockey stick curve at the end where the results fly at you. And it is unbelievable how quickly it comes when you get there. But the power of compounding doesn't happen today. It happens over years. And it's the same. Like writing movies, I sit here writing, and it's not linear I don't like achieve success in a straight line. I'll work at it, work at it, work at it, work at it. And then the success will appear later. And I think it's getting yourself to a point where you will work hard at the investing and the saving for decades. You'll work hard at finding work you love, uh, something you really want to do. You'll work hard at being fit and healthy. And the results come down the line. But you have to invest that energy and time, do things differently over an entire course. Maybe it's six months, maybe it's years, maybe in my case, it's taken me a decade or so to get to this position where I am today. But then all of a sudden, you get to that hockey stick end of the curve and the results come insanely quick. You look like an overnight success, but people don't see the 10 years of work that goes in first. Alan, that is so incredibly powerful. And yeah, I mean, I know I can vouch. I've seen that in my own personal life. It looks like an overnight success, but it's 10 to 15 years of hard work, effort, learning, reading books, listening to podcasts, and really taking action and failing forward, trying things. And you just never know when they're going to work, when they're not. It all kind of comes together. But honestly, for me, it was this faith in myself that just learning things and experimenting and meeting new people and creating connections, that was almost in and of itself good enough. I didn't know if there was some success down the road. I just knew that along the way, as I learned and I picked these things up, it was making me a better person and a happier person. But I'm curious for your own journey, what you felt about that. And also like what you would tell someone out there who, I mean, you're basically saying, okay, follow on faith that you're going to work hard for 10 years and good things are going to happen. That's hard for people because if there aren't those checkpoints, if there aren't those successes along the way, some people give up. And I'd love to hear like what, what you would tell that person. So I've actually been having that conversation recently with uh, Henry who works for me. He's 23. He's young. He's bright. He's full of energy. He's investing. He's saving. 
and you kind of look at his numbers and you haven't seen much progress for the last three years, but he's on the right journey. And if he keeps going, it'll compound and he'll be a millionaire by mid thirties and he'll be able to do whatever he wants. You kind of need to say, look, here's the path. Here's where you're going and show them how you can get there. It is possible. My challenge to anyone who says, well, you know, keeping the faith sounds great is what's the alternative? And the alternative to keeping the faith is to go, well, rubbish to all that. I don't believe it'll happen and I'll just sit here and do nothing. Well, that's the surest fire route to failure you could imagine. So just the fact you've got no better option than having faith and working diligently and going forwards, the other option is just to sit at home and watch Netflix. That's not going to lead to long-term happiness. I've seen that path. It doesn't work. So you've got to have a go. You've got to have faith and you've got to keep going. I guess the second element of this is I've started on my pop-up business schools to introduce some of the concepts of financial independence at the end. And it's challenging when you're talking to 40, 50, 55-year-old people who've never saved a penny in their life. And they're saying, well, I'm 50 now. This is great if I was 30, but what should I do now? This doesn't help me. And my answer is, it doesn't really matter where you are. You've got to start where you are. If you're 50 and you've not really saved, start where you are. You'll at least be better than having nothing. If you're 60 and you've never really saved, well, you might as well start and earn something. The alternative is completely give up and do nothing. And I know that doesn't lead anywhere. So I guess it doesn't really matter where you are or where you've got to. You've got to start where you are. And I think quite often what people do in our world is they try and bypass all of the steps to get to the end. So in investing, it's the people who go high risk, high reward and gamble on individual stocks and shares. And they lose most of the time, but they're trying to make up for lost ground. Or in business terms, it's I'm going to borrow 100 grand and get straight to where I want to get to. And that's a high risk strategy. And people do that to try and make up for it because they've lost time. They've lost space. That's when things start to go really badly. What I would suggest is we've just got to start where you are. If you're 45, you hate your job you don't know what you want to do with your world. Well, that's great. Some of the most exciting things and times are when you don't know what you want to do. Let's start looking for something fun for you that can still make you money. If you've never invested in your 55, that's no excuse not to start now. Let's just start. And I think that's the rallying cry is start where you are, work diligently, and you will make progress. One last piece to add to this. My wife and I only just realized this. Back in the early days when we were looking at self-development, some of the self-development gurus said to us, 80% of success is just showing up. And at the time, I was really annoyed by this because I always showed up and I wasn't successful yet. What I didn't realize was I had to show up over time and keep working for that to become true. And actually, as I've got to my 40s, what I've noticed is just showing up is a skill. The number of people who can't show up to a meeting on time, can't turn up or write a proposal, can't do things, is unbelievable. So start where you are, show up, make it happen, and you will get there. And if you're starting late, it doesn't really matter. Time is going to pass anyway. We've got to just start. Alan, I want to come back to this, this idea that you mentioned earlier, the zone of awareness. And, and I, I genuinely feel that one, people that are listening to this podcast are already open to the idea. Like they identify with Brad and myself on the fact that we want to know everything that we don't know that we don't know. But I'm curious if you could add on to that for people that are, for, for individuals listening to this, that say, I need to increase my zone of awareness as quickly as possible. 
you know, this can't be a 20 year process. I mean, it can be, but in the short term, I need to exponentially increase my zone of awareness. Now, what actionable takeaways or tips could you give to our audience? Step one, Google is incredible. You can Google anything. Step two, go speak to people. It is unbelievable what you can learn from people. And I'll give you a real life example. I read a book. uh, It was a few years ago now. It's called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And it said, take a rich man out for lunch. Now, it was written in the 30s, so it was a bit sexist. So it said, take a rich man. Now it would be just take a rich person out for lunch. So I read that and thought, well, okay, how do I do this? So I remember going to a Toastmasters meeting. This guy uh, called Ralph gave a really interesting speech. He was probably 50, 60 years old. He'd been in the movie industry. And I thought, this is a guy I want to know more from. So I went to him after the meeting. I was quite nervous. I didn't know him. I remember my stomach turning and I walked up to him and I said, look, I've been reading this book, Napoleon Hill, said, take a rich man out for lunch. I have no idea if you're rich or not, but I thought your talk was really interesting. Please, can I buy you lunch? And I remember there being this awkward silence and he, I could, he was looking at me going, is this guy a weirdo? Is he not? Uh, and he said afterwards, he said, well, how about we start with coffee? <laughs> Let's scale it down a little bit. Let's not. <laughs> um, that'll do me. That's good. That's a low risk. Um, so we met for coffee. We had a fantastic chat. And I learned more in that hour about how TV, movies, videos, the different jobs. I learned more in that hour than I would for a week of internet research and about how it really happens. And that breakfast ended up turning, sorry, that coffee ended up turning into breakfast where Katie and I went for breakfast with him and his wife. He thought it was really interesting that I asked him out and asked where we were going next. And he said, well, I've got friends where you're going next. I'll set you up to meet with them. So we went to the next town and met his next friends and they thought it was quite interesting. And they said, well, we'll set you up with our friends in the next town. So every town we went to, we met new and interesting people. Uh, The next group was this incredible guy, Frank, who was producing a musical and had a view into that world. Then we met with these next people. And my zone of awareness of what I knew was possible was expanded beyond belief by going and meeting people outside my normal area of life. So if I could challenge you to do anything, take someone different, take someone weird, take someone wealthy, take anyone out for lunch and find out about them. And I'll tell you what, by asking questions and sitting down with interesting people, you'll learn more about what's possible and not in an hour than you would in two weeks of Google research. And Alan, I want to ask about that. So, okay, you have this first meeting with Ralph, and then you have many of these subsequent meetings with all sorts of interesting people. Obviously, you're not just showing up and talking about yourself for an hour. You're asking questions. But I'm curious, how do you prepare for a meeting like that? Do you do research? Do you have questions written down? Like, I mean, do you rehearse this in your head? I mean, obviously, you don't want it too scripted. But like, talk me through like what you do to prepare for this. So we had one this morning. Uh, Katie's uncle introduced us to someone in Los Angeles. Uh, We met them for breakfast. Um, I read his bio online. I had a little look at what he did. But I'll tell you what, the bios don't normally tell you the whole story. For me, it's about asking questions. So my business partner and Simon and I have this term of what's called a spaghetti question. So how do you know when spaghetti's cooked? You throw it against the wall and it sticks. And My wife is not a fan of that method. I've used it before. (laughs) 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 Says as long as you're going to clean it up. (laughs) How do you know if it's a good question? Well, it sticks. How you know whether a good question is a good question or not is the length of pause that the other person takes after you ask it. So if you've asked a really good question, you can see it on the other person's face and they're having to think. So I have questions that I asked. If you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? How did you get into this? 
what's been the thing that made the biggest difference on your journey? If you were doing it again, what would you do differently? And I'll tell you what, in most of those meetings, I do hardly any of the talking. It's not like when I'm on your podcast monologuing, Jonathan. Uh, Epic monologuing, Alan. Epic monologuing. (laughs) In those meetings, I want to learn and I barely talk. I always remember I interviewed the CEO of a housing association for a project that I was doing. I got an hour of his time. In that hour, I probably asked three questions and I listened for the whole rest of the time. At the end of the conversation, he said to me, Alan, you are a fantastic conversationalist. I've loved chatting to you. <laughs> Alan. I'm thinking, conversation? Conversation? I didn't say anything. <laughs> And then you speak to his PA the next day uh, to wrap the project up. And she says, I don't know what you did, but he loved your conversation. (laughs) Alan, would you, if you have like 10 to 20 of those types of questions that you normally either start a conversation with or, you know, continue with, would you share those with us so that we could put them in our show notes or send them out to the audience in the newsletter? Yeah, absolutely. I'll write them up for you. All right, Alan, just kind of going back to the beginning, we talked about this suit of armor that Christy and Bryce mentioned in their, in their presentation at Chautauqua. Can you talk us through how you personally have fully leveraged that suit of armor in your life and in your business? So I think the suit of armor of getting to financial independence has allowed me to be bolder with what I say and what I do. In England, I'm fighting the battle against the startup loan companies and the government because they are forcing people without money into debt. And I think what they're doing is wrong. And that has allowed me to go bolder into the news, into the media, and to say what I really think without real fear of the repercussions. In my personal life, it's allowing me to follow my dreams. So I've traveled to LA I'm taking seven weeks to write a movie and then see if I can sell it. And that's going really well. Would I have been so bold in my early years? No way. But having this armor from not having to earn enables me to make bolder decisions in my business, my personal life, and in my blog, and to put out information that I think is really valuable and to say what I really think without worrying if it offends. Well, you know what? It's so interesting. I was, you talked about bio just a second ago, and I remember talking to you probably for the first time. And in that first episode, you kind of said that Katie and you were on the path to financial independence and would be there in a relatively short period of time. Well, I just checked your new website, which is awesome. And I'm so excited to follow your journey with all the crazy stuff that you're doing, but I'm reading your bio and it says, today I am financially independent. I run a cool little company, pop-up business school with a team of 12, changing the way that entrepreneurship is taught globally. And I spend my time traveling around the world, working with some of the coolest people. Life wasn't always this way. At school, I was the shyest kid you could meet. I struggled talking to strangers. I was paralyzed by fear, approaching girls, making phone calls or anything else. My family went from wealthy to millions in debt, and we had to do car boot sales, yard sales, at the weekend to raise money to buy food. So what changed? This is what I want to share with you, and it's going to be me in three main parts, entrepreneurships, financial independence, and making dreams come true, number three. And what strikes me is that I'm reading your bio, and I'm blown away by your bio, but that doesn't even come close to covering your story. You know, even in the 40 minutes where we've gone through 40 or 50 minutes and we've gone through all these actionable details, that doesn't come close to unpacking how much actionable content you have because you've executed on that in your own life. And then you've been willing to share with our community so they can have their own version of that in theirs. And and just our community on, on behalf of Brad and myself are so grateful for you taking the time to come on the show, basically, you know, multiple times a year. I absolutely love it. And I think of the pain that I have been through getting to where I've got to. And if I can spare any of your listeners some of the pain that I went through so they can get there a little easier, then it is worth every minute of my time to share that with them. To our audience, I'm sure that you understand why we get so excited about having Alan Donegan on the show. And I appreciate that many of you probably haven't listened to some of our earlier episodes. So Brad, can you explain to them just a few of the episodes that Alan has actually done up to this point and where they can find those? Yeah, I wrote down the whole list here. So the original episode was episode 30 on the side hustle. And then 
Alan was on episode 49 with Barney, the escape artist. And then we did the side hustle business building coaching series. And that was episodes 56, 77 R, 85 R and 101 R. So Alan, we've kind of been on this journey with you for a while. And I think just for our audience, your pop-up business school is transforming business culture. Maybe the same way that the financial independence community is kind of turning personal finance on its head. You have done that with the whole approach to building businesses. And my understanding is, you know, I'm going to say this for you, pop-up business school is spreading across the globe in it's different formats. I'd, I'd love just for our audience, if you could give us an update, what is it and what do you have? What's on the radar? So the pop-up business school's general foundational principle is making the best entrepreneurial education we can free for everyone. So no one's ever paid to come on one of our workshops. So if you ever turn up to one, we ran one in Houston recently. We'll hopefully have one in uh, Charleston later in the year. They're all over England and Wales. We've got a team in New Zealand running them. We genuinely believe that everyone should have the right to earn money doing something they actually enjoy. And that's the purpose of our workshops. That's what we're trying to do. So they're all free. If you ever want to come along, you can check us out at popupbusinessschool.co.uk. And there's plenty of advice on there about how to start businesses, how to make money, how to do something you enjoy. And Alan, if someone wants to connect with you directly, what is the best way to do that? So I've built my own random little blog. I built it myself. So it has lots of spelling mistakes. I saw it was on Weebly, right? It is on Weebly. So I built it for free. Uh, I paid for the domain name and I've built this little thing to share all the life lessons I'm learning along the way and my journey into Hollywood and what happens. So it's alandonegan.com. There's all sorts of stuff about financial independence and things there. Uh, If you want to have a look at that, send me a message. I would love to hear from you. Alan, thanks so much for coming on the show, buddy. I love what you're doing. I love the Choose FI meetups and shout outs to the Houston crowd and the LA crowd. That is incredible what you're building, this community of like-minded people around the world. Thank you. Continuing to increase the zone of awareness. All right, my friends, if you got value from today's episode, if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Just let the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us and what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of Fi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to chooseify.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.